Aloha, everyone. My name is Jackie Hoover, and I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer for the Hawaii Island Economic <laughs> Development Board. And we're pleased to present our third segment of Native Hawaiian Perspectives. Today's discussion will be telescopes, windmills, and the military aside, why are Native Hawaiians protesting? And before we get started, I wanted to um, update our group on the, or update our audience on our panelists. We had shared with you who our four scheduled panelists were going to be, and that was including Keola Lindsay, OHA trustee. We have learned from Keola that his OHA meeting is running late and regretfully he's unable to join us today. So in his stead, we're pleased to include Nahua Gios, who is the board chair for the Hawaii Island Economic Development Board. And those of you who've participated in the earlier sessions have seen Nahua do the introduction. So today I have the privilege and pleasure of introducing Nahua as a bit of a background Nahua is a Big Island-based senior executive, born and raised here, with over 20 years of strategic management experience in operations, administration, finance, business development. And having been raised on a ranch, I know firsthand that she's very comfortable and probably most at home on a horse. So, and she's still smiling. So obviously we gave a good intro for her. So, Let's get started with today's conversation. And I saw someone had a question about time. We really respect everyone's time and we will have a hard stop at 1 p.m. <clears throat> and I'll get back to your busy work days and lives. So I'm gonna kick this off. And of course, our other panelists are John Sabas, Malia Martin, David Kaapu. And I wanna thank you all for being willing to have this talk story session with us today and talk about um, the topic at hand. And I'm gonna kick this off by asking you, Malia, if in your opinion, um, you could share with us underlying systemic issues that perhaps may be serving as a catalyst for um, Hawaiians to rise up and protest. Um. I think in light of the protests that happened throughout the rest of America last year, um, the protest against some things that might move or that could definitely move Hawaii's economy forward with different technologies, with um, sustainable energy, astronomy, and uh, other sources of industry. Um, people are protesting that because of the systemic problems that are still here with Native Hawaiian people. Um, people aren't connecting Hawaii moving forward into the future with uh, resolving affordable housing, homelessness, uh, lack of economic opportunities for Hawaiians for healthcare. And they're not seeing a connection between uh, the benefits of moving forward and having those benefits uh, be received by the Native Hawaiian people after years of, uh, of, of progress for other groups in Hawaii. I think there, there is lack of trust and, um, and real discontent with some of the systemic problems that remain for Native Hawaiian people, even though the rest of the state is moving forward. That's what I think. Thanks for that perspective, Malia. And um, John, if I could move to you, Malia mentioned um, what I'm going to call feelings of disenfranchisement, I guess, and wondering what your thoughts are on systemic issues. Well, I think people are pissed off out there. Yeah, and it's not just Native Hawaiians. I think there's reasons for it. I think they're upset because they don't feel like they're being heard. And not being listened to. Uh, Malia mentioned the word trust, and I think that's uh, something that's um, very relevant to the conversation. There's very little trust on both sides, you know, whether you're in government or whether you're just uh, a regular citizen. Uh, and there's uh, more need for respect, 
respect of each other's points of views. Um, and uh, I think um, given those two, um, uh, I think that's bottom line for me at least, some reasons why there's so much discontent. There's little trust and, and, and there's the respect issue that needs to be plugged into the whole equation. Thank you. And Nahua. I, you know, when I hear, um, when I hear about the protests and, you know, I grew up here um, and a lot of what I, you know, feel is what I've heard sitting at parties and, and lunches and things uh, with a lot of different people. And I feel like I agree with John and Malia that the underlying issue really is that people, we've been told a lot of things as Native Hawaiians and not a lot has been delivered. And you know, I think it's not only Native Hawaiians, but all people, lots of local people that live here, just a lack of action. And so I think the protest is trying to raise awareness that there are these issues out there and that we need to do something about them. And maybe, you know, we shouldn't only be looking at government, but we should be looking at ourselves as well, that we need to be, take a part to play in helping to move forward the different agendas. And I think by starting with the protests is part of that. You know, people are trying to figure out ways on how they can be a part of making the change happen. Great, great. And I'm gonna circle, close the circle and ask David to comment on that. And I will now remind both myself and the panelists and also for the audience benefit. Um, I'll be giving prompts, but from here forward, um, we're looking to the panelists to have a talk story amongst themselves more than having this be an interview per se. So David. Uh, thank you. You know, if, if you look just at our, just look at Hawaii in general, I think systemically the, these issues have been building for I mean, ever since I was was young, um, I, I think people protest because they don't see any other way of affecting change uh, in society, and so it becomes like a a last last resort. And I think if we all think about back to our childhood, we all know of places that um, were open to all of us, right? When we were growing up, that we would go to. Um, and then over the years, somehow you can't go there anymore because somebody has blocked it off or somebody has um, um, put a gate up or somebody has put a fence around it. And I, I think for, for Hawaiians that, you know, that really affects, um, at least for myself, it affects how I look at, at when you're talking about development. Um, because if there is an effort to exclude Hawaiians, then, then of course, the normal thing is because we've always gone there our whole life. When you can't go there, is to get is to get upset. Um, so systemically, I think, I think it's caused by a lot of the change that has taken place um, over the years, um, and so reaching to the point now um, where where if if people believe that there is no other way to get, get someone's attention, whether it be government, whether it be counties, whether, whether or not it be developers, um, then, then I think they look at protesting as a, as a uh, valid way of, of exercising their, their freedom of speech. Great, thank you. Um, so some of the things that you all have um, identified um, as I said earlier, disenfranchisement and feelings of needing to um, find ways to affect change and protests being one of the ways to get their um, voices heard and messages heard, um, as well as poverty, housing, et cetera. Are these issues facing us solvable in the near future and specifically how do we resolve these issues and who is responsible for resolving these issues? You know, I had heard you mentioning, some of you mentioned government and um, others of you mentioned, we can't depend on government 
or we shouldn't depend on government. So really wondering if these are solvable situations and how and who can solve these. I'm gonna take a shot at that. I definitely think that these are solvable issues, um, but we've got to work together. And I think more public and um, private partnerships are really important. Um, working together as a community is important um, because you know we can get a lot done. I mean, we've lived on an island. We're island people. And part of being an island people is working together. And we've got to be able to reach out and talk story and work together. And so I think these issues are solvable. We, we want to help. Um, I always think of, we always want to help those people that are our friends and family. And, you know, this island is our friends and family and we need to help each other. And so doing more private and public partnerships are better rather than just pointing the finger and saying, hey, government's got to do it. It's not just about government. It's about us too, you know, and how we can, help each other and help our friends and family. If, if I can jump in, thank you. I, I, I agree with that. I, you know, the, the one example and I, I'm, that, I, that comes to mind um, that's fairly, fairly recent um, is the development at Kohana Iki. And so Kohana Iki, in my view, and this is only my view, had made a large effort to reach out not only to the lineal descendants of that land, um, but also to to the the native Hawaiians as well. And so, you know, the 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 big controversy at first was that was pine trees, right? Where everybody went surfing, where everybody hung out, they had picnics, they went camping, and the concern was that they that the local people were going to get locked out from that area because this is a very exclusive resort, right? And so, um, I, I think. The, the collaboration which allowed that, that area to remain open, the beach area, which everybody had accessed all their life, um, was, was very, was smart on the part of Kohanaiki, right? They still have their exclusive million dollar homes right there on the beach. And right next to those million dollar homes are uh, local people camping for the weekend and going down there and fishing and still surfing. And so um, I, I think if, if, you know, like Nahua was saying, if it's a collaborative effort, uh, not only on the part of uh, developers, but for example, on the county, if the county in their planning uh, takes into account, you know, the use of the place and how they're still going to provide uses for uh, local people and in particular Native Hawaiians, I think that goes a long ways to to solving some of some of these issues. And I agree with Nahua that it is solvable, but you got to be able to look kind of outside of what the traditional uh, development box has been, which is I buy this land, I, I put up a huge fence and I keep everybody else out, um, which I think doesn't work for Native Hawaiians. Let, let, let me add what Nahua and um, <clears throat> David has, has uh, commented on, which I fully support. Um, I think there's always room for solving problems. I, I think, you know, no problem is unsolvable, but it's got to start, it's got to start with conversations and, and those conversations have to be such that, you know, people feel like they're being listened to, that their, their, their voice has some merit. And, and again, it goes back to the word I used earlier that uh, Malia also threw out there. There's got to be trust, but trust <laughs> doesn't happen overnight. You know, it takes time to build that trust. And then with that trust comes respect. But, um, you know, there, there used to be a, it probably still is, you know, I know it is. There's a Hawaiian custom, come and eat, come and eat. You know, and if, if you accepted that invitation to come to my house to eat, that's the first sign that we're gonna begin a relationship. And once you sit at the table, uh, if you grimace at the food that's presented to you, or if you push it away, or if we say, oh, this is junk, then, then you're not starting off right, you know? But I, I think over time, you know, people will learn that, oh, wow, it's not so bad, or even it is bad, I'm gonna try it, I'm gonna try it. And with that comes the respect, yeah? But, but it, it, begins, it begins with conversations, it begins with an openness 
and and there's always got to be you know that that sense of aloha which is who we are that we may not agree on everything i may not like what's wailing in front of me that you insist that i eat but i'll eat it anyway because i know you're not there to kill me i know you're there because you allow me so i think you know the trust the respect the aloha can help solve a lot of these problems and i think in many of these protests you know there hasn't been enough time or energy spent on people sitting down getting to know each other getting to understand each side's view of life on the specific issue and i think once giving that kind of energy that kind of time then there's room for compromise and there has to be compromise it cannot be this or that you know i think a lot of the protests we see today and the ones that i've been involved with both as a protester and being protested on you know there's an end result and you want that end result to benefit all the people, not just Native Hawaiians, but all the people, as many people as you can. Yes. Right. I agree, Uncle John, thank you. Um, and thank you also, Nahua, for starting off on the positive note of just saying that th these problems can be solved. And it's not just being idealistic, but we, I mean, um, if we can navigate our way out of COVID, we can navigate our way into um, anything else, but we we might have to think differently. You know, when we with this question, when we started talking about government, government, and especially in Hawaii, it's so complex. I mean, the American government started with wanting to throw off the British monarchy, and Hawaii. When we think of government, we love our ali'i. We sing about them. We miss them. America does not do that when they think of monarchy. We just have different ideas about government and um, everything is so complex and it's up for disagreement. But one thing that is not up for disagreement are the physical resources that we have of being an island people. Like um, when uncle was talking about um, coming to eat, like our, our land, we only, we live on islands and we only have this much land. We only have this much food. We only have this much resources. So being island people, I think it would be important for us to look at the actual resources that we have instead of the, um, with government resources, kind of just like with money, I mean, you can print more money and with government, you can theorize more government and create more political things, but you can't create more soil. You can't create more water. You can't create more finite energy like what we have in the islands. And I think um, even though politically Hawaii is in a unique place, geographically and physically, and as far as resources, we have more in common with other island nations. And maybe we have to start thinking um, thinking that way about we're we're an independent island so what are the resources we have you know where you know fossil fuels don't you know we, we're not going to find them on Kauai. you know we're not going to find um certain kinds of foods uh growing on molokai we're um but what do we have we have dark skies we have ocean we have wind we have um all kinds of other energy sources and not just the physical resources and um, not just using them as things for people to look at and uh, pay for with tourism, but to actually use, um, but also our, our human resources. We have generations of people who can interact globally with many different cultures. Um, a lot of places in America don't have people that can interact with comfortably with three different cultures at the same time, but that's, that's an important, um, non-physical human resource that we have in Hawaii. And we think, I think we need to leverage those things, but we have to point it back to the bigger systemic problems for everybody. I mean, there, there, there's part of Hawaii that's, that's doing fine and okay, but um, then why do we have homelessness? Why, why don't we have uh, more native representation in higher education in Hawaii. Why, um, why do we have such high representation in the prison system and in having bad health care? So, um, 
I think it's a matter of, you know, kind of like with living on an island, living in limited space, um, just like in a small community, when you have a family, sometimes the older or more able brothers and sisters have to step up. And um, being on the older side of my family, it's kind of a drag to have to step up for the younger ones who, or the ones who need more help. And, but that's too bad because if, if we don't help our brothers and sisters that need help, it's going to, it's going to affect everybody. And that, I think, um, I mean, Hawaii could be a model of sometimes if you are more fortunate, you have to help those who are less uh, fortunate. And that, that might be the only way that it has to be done, but not in a condescending way, but like in, an, um, in a real it, Ohana way. It makes me think of, um, it makes me think of Queen Liliokalani, you know, in spite of the terrible things that happened with America, um, you know, coming and doing the overthrow, she took that and made it a positive for our native people. And she, you know, helped to keep our native people from being totally wiped out, you know, and even though we became a, uh, a territory, she then took what she had and she made the best of it. You know, she took her money and her resources and helped and they're continuing to help the children of Hawaii today, you know, the orphans and the destitute. So I like that, Malia, that, you know, it's not, sometimes we can't look at what we don't have, but look at what we do have and how can we take what the gifts and the talents that we do have and help those around us, you know? It might be only a little bit, but um, that little bit might be a lot to somebody else. So I agree with you, Malia. And that's such a great segue, both of you, because um, you mentioned our ali'i, and clearly um, the next prompt I was going to offer or ask is um, the overthrow of our Hawaiian kingdom in 1893. Um, I think you've already answered this, but is it still an issue with us today? And how do we resolve or reconcile um, our concerns and our feelings and perhaps pain and anger about the overthrow and what do you think actually could be done and um, you know people talk for example about reparations is that part of the equation or what are your thoughts on that Jackie let me jump in on this one because I may have a point of view that most others won't agree especially the Hawaiian community but you know <clears throat> I don't think that the everyday person gives as much attention or cares as much about it. I think for the everyday person, it's it's having a job, it's uh, having a, a you know food on the table for their family, it, it's trying to educate their kids. I mean, reparations and sovereignty, it, it's good and it's fine. And for a segment of the Hawaiian community, it's very important. And and, and I support whatever they. They do. It's been an ongoing debate for years and years. But in the meantime, there are those people amongst us who cannot find good work, who cannot send their kids to good schools. So for me, it's 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 a, it's an issue out there, and maybe someday it could be resolved, you know. But I think for most of us, you know, that's not as important as having a job. Yeah. <laughs> taking care of our families, you know, making sure our communities are thriving and vibrant and, and, and everybody, as many as can be happy. Yeah. So th that's where I'm coming from on that. And, and not to be any disrespectful for those people who are strongly involved in that. You know, I, I was born and raised on Molokai. So, you know, you, you grow up having a chip on your shoulder either way. You get people from Maui telling you what to do and you get people from Honolulu telling you what to do. And so we become, we become who we are because we don't like telling people telling us how to live our lives or telling us this is good for us. You know, so in, in those years that I lived and worked on Molokai, you know, we did little things to make us less dependent. Yeah, uh, we formed our own planning commission. You know, we got that approval. We didn't have to go to Maui to have the Maui planning commissioners who had only one representative from Molokai sitting on tell us what to do. You know, <laughs> we, we, we developed cooperatives throughout the island, whether it's an agricultural 
a supply cooperative, whether it's a fishing cooperative, whether it's a, a, a cooling plant cooperative, so the people could control it. If it fails, it fails not because of government, although government did help us get started. They helped provide some of the, the startup funds, yeah? But, but it became the people's choices. It became the people's will. Yeah? Sometimes that doesn't all work, you know? Uh, and, and sometimes it's because we lack certain capacities. You know, I, I think in some of these cooperatives, what we lack was, was the, the ability to manage, to, to, to see the economics of, of how things work and how a cooperative could survive and be successful. Um, you know, we, we, I think we have some of the best protesters in the world that come from Molokai, you know, without naming who they are. But, you know, I've been part of that group and proudly, you know, we've succeeded in protesting development or whatever it, windmills, uh, cruise ships coming to the island, uh, uh, you know, hotels being built, um, golf courses, uh, you know, and I've also been on the other side where people have protested some of the stuff I've advocated for. So the end result is, yeah, how do we take care of our people? How do they have a good working job that they can be proud of and they can come home to and, and they can hold their head up high with, with, uh, with pride that there's somebody, yeah? They have a sense of work, you know? Yeah. So to me, that, 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 that's where it is. And, and, and again, no, 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 no disrespect to those people who believe in sovereignty and reparations and all that. But um, frankly, me, I, that's not a priority for me. No, oh, I see you nodding. Vigorous. No, I, I love that. Um, you know, I think, you know, we're, you know, it makes, we all have a, a soft spot in our heart for that, but I love that John's answer because that's true. I mean, we're, we're, we, we just need, you know, jobs and, and homes and we all want to live in this beautiful place we call Hawaii. So I, I, I love John's answer. It's not that we, you know, don't think those things are uh, unaccomplishable, I guess you would say, but um, we're focused on, on more of the day-to-day -day, and I love his answer, that was great. But you know, if I can also add, it's not to uh, make that simple suggestion of having a job, you know, the, 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 the reason why we should sell ourselves out. You know, often <laughs> that's, that's what's on the table developers, uh, you know, everybody will come in and say, well, the people need jobs. They need jobs, you know, but we, we don't trust them, you know, and there's no respect both ways, you know, because yeah, once that issue of jobs is addressed and it's addressed normally in a commission like forum or wherever it is in somebody's office in Honolulu or Maui, we're still left with where's the jobs or that job, uh, how come outsiders are coming in, taking all the jobs, yeah? So, you, you, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's a very complicated issue and it's a sensitive one to all of us, yeah? But, um, you know, it, it's something I think that we gotta deal with. And again, it goes back to me that we, we've gotta build relationships, trusting relationships, one where we respect each other. We're not gonna always agree, but we're gonna work towards solving the problems. Yeah. I. I'm going to jump in. I, I, I have a little bit uh, different take, not because I, I disagree, uh, because I too, since I'm old, um, grew up prior to statehood. Uh, my parents were, as most Hawaiians were, Republicans and supported statehood, right? So um, the whole thing of the overthrow, learning about that came much later uh, in, in my life. But as far as reparations are concerned, one of the areas where I think the Hawaiian community needs to focus on is there's all of these ceded lands that still are retained by the state, right? And I know OHA gets a large, uh, well, all of their revenue, right, from, from the ceded lands. But, you know, for a long time, um, ceded lands were being sold by the state. And so... Um, now it takes what a two thirds majority of both houses in order to sell uh, any any ceded land. But 
you know, for a long time, I mean, that that was happening. And so that 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 goes directly back to the to the overthrow. Right. And so those those properties were supposed to be held in trust for for the Hawaiian people. And so um, as far as reparations are concerned, I think I mean, my view of it is at some point it we have to get the state has to address that issue head on and and I think that was kind of the re one of the reasons for forming OHA. Um, but I think to a large extent, maybe sometimes our legislature, because we have OHA, they, they, they don't look at some of those harder issues because it's, they can say, well, you got OHA, go, go, go talk to uh, OHA about this. Um, which to me, I mean, in, in the number of years that they've been around, they haven't addressed that issue or um, tried to move move us off the dime on the issue of um, the ceded land. So um, I, I I do think that that issue has to be addressed, and and that would that's what I would consider um, reparations um, for as that resulted from the overthrow. David, I'm I'm, I'm glad you brought up the issue of ceded lands. Um, <clears throat> um, there was an editorial a few days ago written uh, by an advocate for having the governor veto HB 499. Uh, it's, a, it's a bill that our firm, I helped work, craft, authored. And, and our purpose, we, we represent our firm in Smith Law, for those of you who don't know. It's, it's one of the <clears throat> largest law firms in the state of Hawaii. And, perhaps the oldest, but our client is the Prince Kuhio Plaza, downtown Hilo. And they've been there for many, many years. And it's like a, it's like a, you know, it's like a community uh, shopping mall where families go there. Probably a lot of the high school kids had their first jobs there. You know, during Christmas time, I'm sure it's a, it's a gathering place for many activities. So our client needs a extension of its lease so that they can go out and put more money and invest more money into the mall to improve it. And so that's why we introduced the bill on their behalf. <clears throat> and it wasn't anything more than that. And, and, and the bill allows for the Department of Land and Natural Resources to uh, make a decision, whether they give them up to 40 years or 10 years or whatever, whoever wants to apply for an extension of its lease. The property at Prince Co Hill is on Hawaiian Homestead land. So the LNR has a say in it, so does DHHL. They have a say on what happens with any kind of requests before government. So what I'm getting at is, is the article that was printed out there, again, raises the word of trust. Do we trust government? Well, it comes down to, yeah, they do not. They do not trust the LNR. Uh, but, you know, if something like this does not go forward, if the governor vetoes it or you know, if you veto it, then it prevents a community like like Hilo, you know, with a with a with a mall like Prince Hill Plaza, from from getting what it could get an extension of its lease, so it could put more money. And we're looking at putting up to fifteen million dollars into that property. So a lot of people are working, on, you know. And again, it's a community gathering place. But I, I raise this issue because sometimes I think we get caught up in all of these debates or protests. And, and, and this one has drawn a lot of interest from many people from throughout, including former Governor Wahe, who is encouraging Governor Ige to veto it. But some of the information that's out there isn't accurate, you know? And I, I think the, the, the total picture of what is and what isn't isn't out there. But I wanted to lay that out there as, as another example of trust and mistrust that sometimes in the end, you know, I think communities lose, people lose, you know, lose because decisions are made based on a lack of full information. But the city lands, going back to the city lands that you brought up, is part of the debate on that property as well. And, and you as a Hawaiian Homes Commissioner, I, I think you, you know in your position that you got to deal with this. You got to deal with this all the time. 
And if this, this if the governor approves it with, with or without his signature, it's going to come to you as a commissioner as to whether or not you let my client get a lease extension. So I just throw that out. And I know you're being very careful on your role as a commissioner, but I'm going to take this opportunity to share with you what I think. <laughs> Thank you. I, I do have to say that I'm appearing here today in my individual capacity <laughs> and not as a Hawaiian Homes Commissioner. So, um, but, but thank you. You're welcome. So we've talked about OHA and um, thank you, David and John, you guys gave us a good um, background on how and why OHA was originally formed and the connection to our ceded lands. What role do you see OHA playing in solving some of the issues and improving the lives of Native Hawaiians? I'll let I somebody would... jump in on that one because I can say a few words about that, but go ahead. Um, I would like to speak to that and also just a note about reparations a little bit. Um, but for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, there are a lot of amazing healthcare programs that they support like um, Iola, uh, Iola Lahui, um, a lot, there are a lot of healthcare and educational programs that they support and um, why isn't it enough? I think it's, it's still a state entity and it still only has um, relatively like the, the prioritization of, of Hawaiian people. It's like, oh, okay, well, Oha, Oha can take care of that. Oha can take care of that. And it, in a way, it's sort of um, those issues, which are bigger than what OHA can handle, are being pushed onto OHA, which isn't big enough. And I think this, um, maybe the state as a whole, Malia, we seem to have lost you. You muted yourself accidentally. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. And also, I just wanted to say something about reparations um, in light of like the national picture. picture. Um, last year, and well, in years before that, when people were talking about uh, reparations for people who have been brought to America for slavery, when that happened, uh, my first thought was, wait a minute, what about reparations for the Hawaiian people and other Native Americans and First Peoples, like how come they didn't get reparations first? So I think just the idea of the need for reparations, I think um, our country and our state has to look back at the economic decisions that put us in these places in the first place. You know, the, the expansion of America was based on uh, an economic system that needed really cheap labor like slavery, and in the same way with the expansion of the state of Hawaii, the plantation system depended on really cheap labor. And we have to look at those systems and say, why have, what have those systems done um, to make it so that people are scrambling for jobs and need those, those kinds of kinds of jobs. So I just, I just wanted to say that, but um, uh, thank you. We're really getting some great and diverse perspectives here. Thank you so much. And John, you had mentioned about being able to speak to OHA and I'm wondering um, if you can speak to whether or not OHA has helped to move the needle forward. Um, in improving the lives of Native Hawaiians, or if you have any thoughts on that, and all of you really. Well, it'd be unfair and inaccurate if I said no, they haven't, because I'm sure they have touched a few lives. But <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm going to use an example, another another 
trust, Hawaiian trust, that seems to succeed in today's world in improving people's lives and in also moving the bar forward when it comes to economics. And that's Bishop Estate Kamehameha Schools. I asked the question, and I've asked this question among, amongst other people, why is it that Kamehameha Schools can so successfully navigate the issues confronting them in building in Kaka'aku, yeah, where they're able to get their permits and construction and, and, and they build these you know, nice little high rises in Kaka'aku where OHA cannot, they cannot, they cannot. And in my opinion, I think they have to change their model. It's okay to protest, yeah? But at some point you have to come up with solutions. You have to come up with some legitimate reasons why you have to look at our options. But then it goes back to some of my earlier comments. I don't think that OHA has spent enough time building trust and developing respect amongst the decision makers beyond OHA. Yeah. I think the OHA board itself over the years have left a lot of us questioning what their purpose is and, and mostly how they work to, together. They've been in conflict for too long and continues to be, I think. So I think they have to change and I, I think they can do more I think they can do a whole lot more, but um, you know the verdict's still out of just what changes they bring about within their own organization. They've got a lot of young people in there now. Um, they've got some seasoned uh, veterans on the board, but um, if they cannot move their own priority agendas forward, why? Why not? And I think part of it is because they, 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 they're not working and then I'll use again Kamehameha Schools. I mean, they, they're able to move the, 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 you know, the bar forward and, and, and get what they need done economically and to take care of their beneficiaries, which is the education of the kids in the state, so. Great comment. You know, one of the things that we've seen just with our panel today um, really reiterates that when it comes to our Native Hawaiian community, there isn't a single body or a single group that can speak on our behalf. How do we determine who actually and truly speaks for a community? And what can we do about um, and what happens when various communities, including within our Native Hawaiian community, don't agree with each other. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, jump in and speak about that also because uh, it looks like um, a participant posted asking, do you think sovereignty and US recognition would help solve these issues? Um, and during our uh, practice session, Hui, um, I was specifically thinking, oh, we shouldn't bring up uh, federal recognition because it's such, uh, it's so complex. But I mean, it can't, it can't be avoided. With federal recognition, is the idea of of the U.S. recognizing Hawaiians like one tribe. But I mean, in the past few years, I mean, when we think of America. There's not one Native American tribe. I wonder, and I put this out here just because we're we're open to listening to new perspectives. But even in Hawaii, um, there are things specific to each island. I mean, with the Hawaii Island Economic Development Board, this is unique to Big Island, <clears throat> different from Oahu, different from Hawaii, and um, I've been wondering about the different groups of Hawaiians that have things in common, but have things that are different. And um, I don't know if, in the end, I don't think there's one voice right now that can speak for every Hawaiian, but I think that's okay. I think we have a lot of things in common and it's 
hard to define in modern culture. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens, but it's, you know, before all, you, all islands were under Kamehameha, the islands were different. So I wonder what that, what, um, that will show in the future with diversity within the Hawaiian people and not, I mean, there, there is. Malia, you muted yourself again. <laughs> there is, um, there's importance with solidarity, but unity doesn't need to be uniformness, you know. You know, I think Malia raises some good issues here. Um, prior to Kamehameha, each island had their own king, their own chief, so everybody ran their own show, yeah? <laughs> and then, and then with the help of, you know, Captain Cook and those guys or whomever helped him, you know, was able to conquer the rest of the islands. But, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I'd like to use that, and his name was thrown out earlier, and his name was thrown out by Malia, um, a Hawaiian, a native Hawaiian, who's at a very, very important uh, John DeFries, you know, I, I think we all know John um, and, and he's head of the tourism industry. And I think he's trying to do the best job he can, but right now, early in his, his, his uh, employment with HTA, Hawaii Tourism Authority, I'm, I'm sure he's facing some challenges from different sectors, whether it be, you know, the legislators or where, yeah, within his own industry. But I look at John as a, a positive Hawaiian leader yeah, who's taken upon his shoulders a huge monument of task. Yeah? You know, COVID, I would think, taught him and all of us major lessons. Yeah, the pandemic taught us. And, you know, now when I go to work, the traffic's just as bad as it was pre-COVID. You know, you got a call to make a, uh, you know, a, you know, reservation at a, at a restaurant, you can't get one till nine o'clock at night. You know what I mean? So John's got to deal with, okay, what do we do now given the experience of the pandemic? What do we do now to make tourism still the engine that drives Hawaii's economy, but in a way that the local people, the residents can live with it, yeah? And so I, I look at John as, you know, he's not the Kamehameha, He's, you know, he's one of, I'm sure, many other Hawaiian leaders out there, but I, I think we owe him our support, not only because he is Hawaiian, but I think because his heart is there. Yeah, I, I think, you know, he grew up in the industry. He grew up in Waikiki. You know, he's well-educated, and, and I think he means well, but, but he needs as much support as he can get to, to move this thing forward, you know, so... I don't know if that answers your question, Jackie, but, but I, I think, you know, I, I'd like to just throw out a, a, you know, an example of somebody out there and then others may differ with me. Yeah, and, and that's fine. And, and then we can have whole open pono if you disagree with me or you can tell him I come to my house, we can talk story. But, but I, I think somebody like John DeFries is trying to do the best job he can. And I think he's good, good for our community and our state. So I try to answer your question that way, Jackie. And the questions really are meant just as prompts and um, for all of you to share your perspectives. One of the things that I try to remind people is we're not trying to change anybody's mind. We're just trying to share perspectives and have the diversity that we see in our own community, including our Native Hawaiian community um, shared and so forth. It's one of the ways I think we build trust and respect and are able to share and have our voices heard. Um, David, you've been quiet for a few moments. You should be happy. <laughs> um, um, you know, as far as, well, when I read, when I, when I listened to the question, uh, it, it, it's very interesting because it, it assumes for some reason that Hawaiians as collectively need to agree on a strategy. And, 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 and I agree with Malia and I agree with John, John that, that, you know, we, we're, that's not gonna happen because that's not how, <laughs> that's not kind of how we were raised, right? Is we weren't raised to 
have a collective conscience and go along with, um, you know, whoever is the po or whatever. But, you know, and it, and it, I think the issues are local and, and you hear that a lot. And so, you know, even in, in your, in your communities, there are, there's going to be differences of opinions among Hawaiians and that's fine. Um, I, I am more looking for, like John was saying, the leaders to emerge that can, that can take, um, even in your area, that group in a, in a direction that's positive. Um, and that, that has the best interests of the Native Hawaiians at heart that, that helps us grow as, as people. Economically, of course, we wanna make sure that people are successful. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think that just the question, um, I, I wouldn't phrase it that way. I, I, would, I would try and phrase it um, that we need to be more how can we be more collaborative amongst, even though we have differences amongst the different Hawaiian groups? Um, and and I agree that that historically that was you know there was no collective conscience of Hawaiian people like Malia was saying we were all um, very different. I mean, I mean, Kamehameha didn't even want to go to Molokai right because they had all the the kahunas there and so. You know, and and Kau, and you know, there's all these different places that that they just have their own culture, and I think I think if we are able to look at those different cultures um, and develop them more place based, I think that might be more important in moving us forward as opposed to trying to put us all into a large collective. But that's my thought. Thanks. No, that's fabulous. Um, and it does, you know, give us the opportunity to look at things through different lenses. And that's what our perspectives program is Jackie, all about. Jackie, I don't know yes. we're running out of time here, but can we switch gears a little bit? Uh, to Absolutely. The it's your to talk military. story. Yeah, to the military. Sure. Uh, I, I know we haven't mentioned it at all. And so I'd like to hear you know, other people's perspectives on the military. Panelists, that's you. I, you know, my husband's a retired Marine. And so um, I have a unique perspective on the military, plus being a Hawaii Island resident. Um, I think it's an important part of our culture and who we are. And um, here in the middle of the Pacific, we, you know, if, if we didn't have the military here, I think we would be very vulnerable to other people, you know, the Japanese or whoever, or terrorist groups or anything like that. So I think the military is an important part of, of our national security, but I also think, you know, in Oahu, they're an important part of our economic diversity and it really helps there. And then, I mean, I got recently was had an opportunity to be able to go up to Umi's temple and the place at PTA where they're training today was a place where in native times, the Hawaiians trained. Um, and so it's kind of cool to see the connection of, you know, Umi's Heao up in that area and PTA. But I think it, the, the military, I know we're running out of time, is very important. And I don't think, you know, we should discount that. And, and the reason why I, I raise it now, uh, yeah, we are running out of time, um, you know, I think the military needs a lot of work still in, in building relationships with the community. Um, you know, and, and, and I worked for Senator Inouye for a couple of years and my roommate worked for him for a long, long time. And it was always his, almost his order to all the new military leadership coming to Hawaii to work with the community, yeah, to build those bridges. And, and I think you know, over time, yeah, it's improved, but it still leaves a lot to be desired, uh, you know, and because they change commands, they change commands, and then they're left with the person here that didn't know the history, and, and you know, and then this promises me, there's been promises made that uh, are unfulfilled, just as bad as, you know, you know, the trust me issue again, going back to other forms of government. So the military has a huge role 
and 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 they provide huge economics to to the to the state but if they do not improve more on their relationships with the local community um especially without a senator like senator Inouye that around you know they, they they could lose a, a lot and so will the community you know so um, you know that there's often times where i see and i hear where you know our people whether you be hawaiian or not hawaiian are, are not provided the opportunities that's given to those who come from the mainland and, and i won't go into specifics but it goes to my issue that you know the military needs to wake up stay awake because you know the protests that's already happened on, on, on in different you know arenas whether it's you know makua or it's Wakaloa or whatever you know will continue unless they really put some emphasis in working with the communities and and be real about it develop trust you know learn to respect each other's views yeah and do it with aloha thank you we've got just a couple of minutes left and i want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I saw David nodding and no? Okay, if anyone, does anyone have any last remarks that you'd like to make? And again, you know, I'd like to remind the audience, one of the reasons we're sharing these perspectives is to act, ask, act as a catalyst um, for having discussions within our community and you all having your own talk story sessions. And so I'd like to close out with um, one question. How can federal government agencies best obtain a sense as to what our um, Native Hawaiian community's position is on specific issues? You know, um, so often they're put in a position of wanting and trying to help and not understanding where and what the help is that's needed and how we as a community um, feel. So I'm wondering if there's a question, if there's an answer to how that sense can be best obtained. I think it's interesting that you asked about the military and then asked this question about federal um, federal departments when the military is the biggest one. Um, the reason Hawaii is part of America is because of our strategic military position. And um, I think there's a way we can live with the US military here as a public school parent. I know there would be no way that the DOE would get the money that it does without the enrollment of um, military children in our public schools. But um, I, my, my biggest thing to look at is uh, examples like Koho Olave. Uh, if we're if Hawaii is used uh, for for military purposes, uh, I, I hope the federal government and other agencies can help us to clean up and restore things the way that they're supposed to be um, in, in all areas. So in short, I would say that. Fantastic. I want to thank our panelists so much for joining us. I'd like to also thank Nahua Gills, who, as I mentioned earlier, is the chair of Hawaii Island Economic Development Board. We believe that our Native Hawaiian Perspective Series is very important and is, in fact, as I mentioned earlier, say, serving as a catalyst for us as a community to have more discussion openly and with the respect to build the trust that we've heard needs to be rebuilt. So thank you so much. We will, as always, have the recording available and all of you who are online who registered will get a link to that recording and we'll also be advising you when our next perspectives will be um, tentatively scheduled for July and we'll get that confirmed and get that out to you as soon as possible. So I'd like to say mahalo John, mahalo Malia, mahalo David, mahalo Nahua, and mahalo to everyone who joined us today. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.